for a vast number of complicated reasons, Milton has invited for 350 years now a uniquely violent, and I do think it's a violent response to the particular question of his value as a, as a poet. And the violence, I think, of this reaction is due in large part to our tendency to think of Milton and, to, uh, and of Milton's work in terms of the category of power. So I've given this first lecture a title, the title being Milton, Power, and the Power of Milton, because any introduction to Milton has to confront the long-standing conviction in English letters of Milton's power or his strength as a, as a poet. And it's practically impossible to begin a reading of Milton without the burden of of innumerable prejudices and, and, and preconceptions. Milton's reputation always precedes him, and in fact, that's always been the case, even in his lifetime. And even if we've heard of nothing of Milton the poet, or, or nothing of Milton the man, we're certainly, of course, likely to have heard of, of Adam and Eve, and of the story of Garden and Eden. So, and so it's especially difficult uh, to read Paradise Lost without bringing to it some sense of the power of the of the religious problems, the theological and ethical problems that that story seems so powerfully to set out to address. Now, readers, readers of English literature talk about Milton very differently uh, from the way they talk about other, other writers. Historically, it has not been uh, pleasure or wit or, or beauty that have been associated with the experience of reading Milton. Those are the categories of value that we tend to associate or to affiliate with our other favorite writers, writers as diverse as, uh, as, as Shakespeare and uh, Virginia Woolf, for example. But in, in our collective cultural consciousness, if there's such a thing, uh, whether we like him or not, we tend to think of Milton, we tend to think of John Milton as powerful. And the reasons for this coupling of the, of the name Milton and of this idea, or the metaphor of power, I think are worth looking into. Power is a conceptual category that Milton brooded on and, and, and cultivated his entire writing life. From a very early age, Milton nursed the image of himself as a powerful poet. And, and, and in Milton, we have a man who was able to state, now just think about this for a moment. It's, I, I, I take this to be an absolutely remarkable fact. We have in Milton a man who was able to state categorically in his early 20s, so just a few years older than you are now, that the epic poem that he would not even begin writing for another 25 years would become an unforgettable work of English literature. Milton anticipated and lovingly invested his, uh, all of his energy in his future literary power and his future literary fame. He anticipated this power much as his father the reasonably well-to-do banker uh, might have uh, anticipated long-term earnings from a particularly risky business venture. And in Milton's case, the, this, this investment in power paid off. Milton would come to feel, would eventually come to feel so comfortable with the, with the mantle of power that he was able to do much more than simply rewrite the first, the first books of the Bible, which is, of course, one of the things that he accomplished in Paradise Lost, and that is itself no, no mean undertaking. By the end of his life, though, Milton would, in effect, try to rewrite everything. A after he'd published all of his major poems, he, he began publishing a spate of works that attempted to recreate British culture from the ground up. He, uh, he invented his own system of, of philosophical logic. He published a treatise that he had written earlier on, on grammar, inventing his own system for the understanding and the, the, the learning of the, of the Latin language. He wrote a long and detailed history of Britain, attempting uh, to create the meaning of that little island that, that he always assumed was God's chosen, chosen nation. And finally, and probably for more, Milton most important, uh, Milton wrote a theology, inventing, in effect, his own religion. And Milton's, uh, Milton's Protestantism looks like, uh, looks like no one else's since, uh, before or since. There, there's, a, a real sense, I think, in which Milton wanted to recreate all of Western culture, or, or to recreate all of Western culture in his own image. And regardless of what we think of the success of that example, or of the appeal of the attempt to do such a thing, the amazing thing, I think, is that Milton felt so empowered even to embark on such an enormous project. And readers, 
And readers of Milton ever since have had to confront not just Milton's writing, but this unspeakable sense of empowerment that, that underlies um, just about everything that Milton writes. And so it, it, it seems to me that a useful introduction to the poetry of Milton would be a look at some of the various, various types of power that Milton imagines in his work and, and some of the types of power that literary history has, has tended to confer upon, uh, upon Milton the man, the image of Milton the man and of Milton's, and Milton's writing. Now probably the form of power that, that we most readily associate with, uh, with John Milton involves his position at the dead center of the English literary canon. Milton is, this is, this, this is, this goes beyond questioning. He's an object of worship by British and American institutions of, of higher education. And uh, my guess is that uh, many of you have failed, uh, that few of you have failed to observe that it's practically impossible to graduate from Yale with a Bachelor of Arts in English without having read uh, Paradise Lost, either in English 125 or, or DS Lit, or in fact, in a course just like this one. This, for you, some of us will be, this, this is the course. And, uh, and you, those of you who are taking this course, <laughs> because you have, to, uh, you have to take one of the pre-1800s, and Milton is one of those, um, you are more than entitled to ask, why the poet, this poet Milton, is exercising this institutional sway over you as you go about uh, choosing your courses, or perhaps you experience your courses in some way as, as having been chosen for you. It, it would be utterly inadequate for us to account for this institutional, and it's a real institutional power that Milton holds over us, by stating uh, blandly that Milton is the greatest, the greatest English poet. That's the easy answer, obviously, and of course it's not, it's not untrue. But, but, but uh, uh, we can do better than that. And we can anatomize some of the forms of power that have been most commonly attributed to this greatest, to this greatest English poet. There is first the, um, the understandable aesthetic power, the power of the beauty of, of, Milton's, uh, of Milton's verse, that, uh, uh, an aesthetic power that's often thought or felt to adhere somewhere in the poetry itself. A and in fact, for, for, for readers of Paradise Lost, and this has been an experience now for a few hundred years, it does often seem as if there were some mysterious life force uh, pulsating through Milton's dense and driving lines of, of unrhymed iambic pentameter in, in Paradise Lost. Then now there's also the power, there's also the power that Milton himself claimed was behind the poetry of Paradise Lost. Milton insisted, and it's completely possible that he might actually have believed that God himself was responsible for composing the poetry of Paradise Lost, that Milton, Milton, John Milton was merely the conduit for God's first serious attempt at, a, at an epic poem. And, and so we have, in, in, in this perspective, we have an image of the awesome power of the deity himself thundering away behind every jot and and tittle of, of, of Milton's great epic. But for Milton's, Milton's contemporaries in the 17th century, Milton's power really wasn't at all aesthetic or, or even religious in nature. Milton, uh, Milton's pr power was primarily seen as social and political or, and, and cultural. Milton, and this is a, a, a wildly anachronistic use of terms, but it's, there's, there's nonetheless a a lot of sense to it. Milton was essentially a left-wing political radical, and it was widely feared by his more timid contemporaries that, that his writings would seduce, seduce his readers into rejecting uh, good old-fashioned traditional uh, religious and social values. And, and there was a, there's a lot of validity to that contemporary cultural fear. Uh, Milton was. Milton was a revolutionary. He was responsible for writing the first justification for an armed rebellion against a legitimate monarch, uh, the, the first to publish such a work in uh, essentially in all of Europe. Um, Milton actually wrote that it was the duty, not just the right, but the duty of a nation to rise up and dethrone, uh, dethrone through execution an unjust and legitimate, though legitimate king. And Milton, in fact, 
was largely responsible, responsible in a cultural sense for the fact that the armed rebellion of England's Civil War, what we, call, what we think of as the Puritan Revolution, actually led to the execution, the execution by decapitation of England's monarch Charles I in 1649. And on top of all of this political revolution, uh, the political radicalism, Milton was one of the first intellectuals in Europe to speak out in favor not only of, uh, of divorce, Milton argued for the, uh, the, the right to divorce on grounds of incompatibility, but also um, he, argued, he argued in favor of the, the right to uh, plural marriage, pol polygamy. He was branded as a radical and dangerous debunker of, of traditional Christian family values. Uh, now, many, many of you know that Milton, in his later years, was blind. And, and the fact of his blindness was, in his own day, frequently cited by contemporary preachers, men at the pulpit, uh, as an example of exactly how God punishes those who dare to write against the king, or those who dare to write against the institution of marriage or the family. And, and Milton's uh, power for so many of these contemporaries was, was, was seen as palpably destructive and, 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 and truly frightening. Obviously, uh, I, I, it goes without saying that today, the assessment of Milton as some kind of imminent social threat um, or some sort of social force in terms of his, uh, the radical nature of political power, that has taken a sharp turn. Milton is much more likely imagined to wield and I, uh, if, if you have any sense of what the mythology surrounding Milton is, you would have to agree with this. Milton's much more likely to imagine, to be imagined to wield a socially conservative power over his readers. In, in, the, in the debates ranging uh, for the last 30 years or so, over the value of traditional pedagogy and, and over the value of canonical reading lists, Milton is always cited, invariably cited, as the canon's most stalwart a representative of oppressive religious and social values. And there's, there's no question, Milton is the dead white male poet uh, par excellence, in, in, in English letters certainly. A and his poetry works, at least from this point of view, his poetry works to solidify those dead white male values, whatever those are, in the unsuspecting minds of his readers, none of whom obviously are dead and many of, and many of whom are neither white nor, nor male. Milton's, Milton's power, from this perspective of the radical, uh, the radical cultural critique, is really not so different from the power of the, of, of the late Jerry Falwell, or, 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 or some, someone like Rush Limbaugh. Um, there, there's something uh, insidious and culturally uh, malicious and powerful about the social conservatism of, of what is thought to be his voice. Now this more or less, this is the contemporary picture uh, of John Milton, and this more or less contemporary picture of Milton as, the, as a powerful force of conservatism derives in large part uh, fr from the English writer Virginia Woolf, who was writing, uh, who, who wrote for a few decades, but wrote about Milton during the 1920s. And it's Woolf's image that's probably the one that's most firmly rooted in the minds of Milton's readers today. For Virginia Woolf, especially in a, a uh, a room of one's own, the dead writer Milton exercises an active power, an active power at the present moment as he forces his female readers to accept their subordinate place in society. And, and the text of Milton, and especially of Paradise Lost, ha therefore has to be seen as an active, uh, persistently malignant conveyor of, of patriarchal op op oppression. Now, like all, uh, like all judgments of literary value and literary power and force, the, the 20th century feminist evaluation of Milton, Virginia Woolf's, has a, has a complicated and long, long prehistory. And it's worth our while to look briefly at some of the complicated steps by which an evaluation like Virginia Woolf's actually comes into being. So let me, let me take you back. This is, you, can, you can now look at your handouts. Let me take you back to the 17th century, up to the very beginning of the literary reception of, of John Milton. So Milton, who had died in, who, who died in 1674, had established himself as a great English poet within 20, within 20 or so years of his death. 